Okay, I'm showing 12 o'clock on my end. I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. Good afternoon and welcome everybody to our latest installment of Toastmasters District 57 Masterclass on Zoom Etiquette and Beyond presented by Linda Patton. My name is Patricia Dessa. I am the voice behind the tile that says District 57. I'm also currently the D57 Masterclass Chair and your host this afternoon. We're gonna to get to Lin Linda just momentarily, but few, I, first I wanted to get to just a few logistics before we get started. For those who are asking about a recording, this webinar is in fact being recording, recorded and a link to that recording is going to be available on the District 57 website on the Masterclass page. I'll give you more specific information about that later. It generally takes at least a couple of days to get it on there. Another logistical piece for today is regarding questions and answers. So the way this is going to work is Linda is going to be doing three cycles of a 15, about a 15 minute presentation, followed by five minutes of questions and answers. Linda has asked that all questions be put in the chat box. So all participants will be muted for the entirety of the webinar. And you're well, welcome to also put comments in the chat box. I will be asking the questions in the Q&A section when we get to those points. And I just covered the muting piece that all participants are in fact muted for the length of the presentation. With that, I'm gonna ask Linda to go ahead and pull up her slides while I introduce her. Linda Patton is relatively new to Toastmasters International. In fact, she's only been a member since December of 2019, but she's made a lot of strides since then. She has just been appointed the District 57 Finance Manager for the 2021 year, and she's soon to be awarded the Triple Crown and Outstanding Achievement Toastmaster Awards. Linda is an international speaker and best-selling author of over 10 books, and she is a leadership expert, mentor, and trainer of a signature program called Confluential Leadership. She's had leadership positions in over 20 professional organizations. And outside of her professional career, interesting to note, she was also a US Army major. Linda currently lives in Walnut Creek with her husband of 45 years, and she has two adult daughters and also a Wheaton Terrier. She is here today to present on, give us a masterclass, in fact, on Zoom etiquette and how to optimize your participation as an attendee, a presenter, or a host. With that, please welcome Linda. And Pat, you need to unshare your screen. Thank you, ma'am. I want to be very honest with you. This hour is not going to be spent on the technical aspects of Zoom. Zoom does a really great job of training on how to log in, how to do breakout sessions, how to set up your Zoom rooms, how to set passwords and enable waiting rooms and so on. This is not what this program's about. With having been in more Zoom meetings since March 20th, than I ever expected to be in in a decade. I felt that this was an important topic for us to talk about at this time. We use Zoom for team meetings, for club meetings, yoga classes, meditations, training, and just getting together with people that we care about. If you have Zoom, you're about 80% on the way to having the best video communications possible. So what about the other 20% you ask? My goal today is to examine how you show up at the Zoom meeting. It's giving you the ability to create a professional appearance, background, and presentation. What I'm going to share with you today is an accumulation of things that I've seen when I started on Zoom 
and in many cases are still seeing now and that don't support us as guests, hosts, or presenters. My objectives for you are to come away with an increased comfort with the digital platform, an increased professionalism as a guest and a host, and increased confidence in your own presentation. Does that sound good to you? If so, you can hit the reaction button. Down, lower right. Okay. If so, let me know in the chat or in the reactions box. These are some of the areas that I'll talk about and not necessarily in this order. These are points that make you credible and accessible. These are the things that if not done well, will drive your audience crazy. I know it does me. So we're gonna talk about how you set up your studio, the quality of your audio and your video, some host etiquette, some guest etiquette, and definitely your digital connection. You saw this picture in Patricia's introduction of me. Yes, this is me. But why this picture? When I started working with my first coach, I told her all the things that I didn't have and wouldn't do. I didn't have a website, and now I'm on my fifth iteration of the site. I didn't do blogs, and I wasn't sure that I ever wanted to write one. Now I have over 500 that are available on my website. I told her I didn't do radio, well, I had a radio show for two years on Voice America, and it's currently in syndication. I wouldn't do television. Well, I lied there too. I've been doing many different television shows, including Toastmasters Time TV, and I love it. And I said I wouldn't write a book. Well, as you heard, Patricia said, I have 10, eight compilations and two of my own. One is The Art of Herding Cats, Leading Teams and Leaders, the other being, no one stood up when I entered the room, one woman's journey from command to true leadership. That was an international bestseller. I also said I would never speak from stage under any circumstances, but I'd be happy to teach classes. Well, now I'm an international keynote speaker on leadership. And the last piece I said, I don't do social media. Well, I'll be honest, I still don't do social media. Luckily, I have a fantastic VA who you saw at the beginning actually created this pro program for me, Carrie Hargraves, and she takes care of that for me, and I love her for it. What does this have to do with the picture? Well, when I started on digital platforms, it was Google Hangouts. Some of you may remember that. My coach told us at the time that we had to dress professionally, thus the jacket, which I'm wearing today, full stage makeup, hair professionally styled, and a smile whenever and for however long we were on camera, which was the entire length of the show, sometimes several hours. Do you know how hard it is to smile continuously for that long? Needless to say, this has changed a lot since then. Some of the changes are good and some are just plain odd. Let's see what I mean and how we can change that. Let's start with you. Video now is more critical to your business than ever. You provide education through webinars, which seem to have grown like weeds since shelter in place, or as I have a colleague, shelter in grace. We have team meetings to discuss and decide on projects and their plans. We're in Toastmasters and have our club meetings, our leadership team meetings at all levels, all sizes, as well as our speech and evaluation content on digital platforms. We use it for coaching and consulting with our clients. Most of us use Zoom, with others using things like WebEx, Skype, Microsoft Teams, GoToMeetings, and so many other platforms. As they say, choose one and own it. Make sure you know your platform and are comfortable with all its features so that you provide the best experience for your participants. Here you go. All you need are a couple of hands 
to have a true Kilroy is here experience. If you sit to present, to host a meeting, or just to be a participant, it's important that your camera is positioned such that you show from chest or waist high all the way to the top of your head. Seeing just your eyes or another part of your head has people what, wondering what's going on below? Wouldn't you like to know what he's really doing? Seeing just your eyes really is not the best way to present yourself in a video presentation. Also, facial expressions are important for both the speaker and the audience to gauge reaction to the presentation. What expression or emotion do you get from this picture? Probably not very much, other than the fact that he looks interested. I'm sure that you've been and seen people with this view speaking and then ducking down so that little or nothing shows of their head. What are they doing? Are they, think, are they looking for something or are they reading from their script? And it's down lower left or lower right. This is all very mysterious and it has your audience more intrigued with what you're doing and what you're not showing than what you're saying. The other extreme is also possible where you're so far up in the screen that your, the top of your head is cut off. Again, think of the screen as a frame for your picture. How do you want to be seen? Not like this. This is wrong in so many ways. If she's sitting, then she's moved the camera so that not much of her head is showing. In fact, her head is cut off, as I mentioned in the previous slide. However, if she's planning on standing to present, then again, she's way out of her frame. Again, the audience should see from the top of your head to just about waist high. It's very important for you to test your frame to know exactly what's being seen there and how much room you actually have for gestures and movement. I know that the first time that I tried this, I was fine in the middle, and actually I was fine on the left. But when I moved to the right, which was my left side, it was out of the frame. Gestures were lost, and the audience was totally confused. If you've been on Toastmasters Time TV, you know that they use a red oval rug on which you stand. It's the perfect size for the frame that they have. It is also very narrow and doesn't allow for gigantic gestures or movements. So you need to judge what you have going on with you and what your gestures and movements might be. I had one wonderful speech coach who suggested that instead of moving left to right, that you just turn and speak from there. And I thought that was a really great idea. If you choose to move the camera way back so that all of you is visible, recognize that your audio may not follow you. Also, I've noticed that the picture from that distance is not always very crisp or clear. And you really want to be as crisp and clear as you possibly can be so that people can see your expressions, your movements, and your gestures. What is, hello, what is recommended for audio is to use a wireless mic or your cell phone as your audio device. It just needs to be clear and loud enough. We really don't want your audience straining to either see or hear you. And I'm gonna say this over and over and over again, but do test your audio and video before you get on camera. The I. One additional caveat. Let's not get too close to the camera, especially if as you adjust it. Make sure that you do your adjusting before the program begins. Watching individuals adjust their camera with arms, heads, eyes, and other parts of their body coming in and out of the screen can be very annoying and also very disconcerting. Be ready when you get in the meeting to be fully engaged and not be adjusting everything. This is really a time to arrive early. Check yourself out. 
Zoom usually gives you a screen before entering the room to test your audio and your video. Take advantage of this so that when you walk in, you are totally prepared and ready to begin. We talk a great deal about eye contact. It's so important in audience engagement. You want everyone in the audience to feel that you're speaking just to them. When you're in gallery view and you can see everyone in the room, there's a tendency to do what you do live. And that is look at each individual in the eye. The problem is your camera is at the top of your screen and therefore it doesn't follow your eyes. It's stationary and to me even more difficult to find on my phone, which is why I tend not to use it. When in a more formal setting like presenting, then looking at your camera makes it feel like you're looking at each and every one of your audience members individually. This definitely increases your presence and your authority. If you're in a more informal setting, like you're sitting down and having a virtual coffee chat with a colleague, then by all means, you can look at the screen if that's appropriate. We talked a little bit about this and, and about the frame of your camera. It is not all that large unless you've moved way back from it. Just like eye contact, gestures are just as important to your presentation. The trick is to know how big you can make those gestures. Can you do those huge global gestures that you're used to doing when you're standing up on stage live in front of your audience? If they're outside the frame, they will distract your audience. If they're too small or below the level of the camera, the audience will still be distracted, wondering what the gesture really was. It can look like you're just randomly flapping your arms off screen. Plan and practice your gestures with your camera, just as you would practice your words. They are all an integral part of the power of your speech. Clothing matters, and I actually had a conversation with some of the other masterclass presenters about this. Perhaps if it's a visual coffee gathering, you can come in your hoodie or something very casual. However, what you wear on the upper half of your body is important to your professional image. A speaker coach told me that you can wear anything you like below the waist and below camera height, including pajamas, as long as you don't plan to stand up to speak. She would put on her signature earrings, her beautiful necklaces, have a stylish jacket and blouse, and have her hair styled. She looked the part as a speaker coach. Below, she was wearing sweatpants and slippers, and we never knew. Another caution is to avo avoid patterns and colors that can distract or obscure. Leave items like bold floral prints, shiny fabrics, and fuzzy details in your closet. There are perfect times for them, just not on video. The question is then, if I'm presenting or hosting a meeting, what should I wear? Well, this is the rule that I was drilled with when I was going into my first job in corporate. Wear what the person in the job you want next is wearing, presuming that you're looking for a promotion. The rule was to be one step above your audience. This again establishes credibility and authority. As you're able to see in my thumbnail, I am actually wearing the jacket from the earlier pictures of me. You might, might not be able to see it, but knowing how I'm dressed puts me in a different mindset. It also sets the tone for the meeting or the presentation. If you want casual, then do business casual. And what that is, is a polo shirt, a sweater, or even a button down shirt without a tie, top button perhaps undone. 
again, what you wear on the bottom doesn't matter unless you are standing up to speak. So each of these are a little bit different. The gentleman at the left is in a formal suit. He is perhaps addressing a more formal event. The woman in the middle is more business casual, and we all know Carilla DeVille, she's always well-dressed. So Patricia, what questions might we have from our audience? I am actually not seeing any questions that haven't already been addressed. So let me just give a few seconds for folks to type in something in case anyone was mid-question. There is, okay, now we have a, a comment and a question. So the first is just a caution against uh, what you choose to wear from the waist down in case it's inadvertently shown. So whether or not you're intending to stand up, it can be, I think the implication here is that it can be inadvertently shown. So to be careful about that. Absolutely. And there's a question about um, showing our faces, should we show our faces? So I'm, I'm wondering if there is what you think about video versus no video. Um, actually, Patricia and I talked about this. I said, so should I, I just have my muted thumbnail sketch up or should I you know, be live? And we both agreed that a presenter being live is very, very important. Again, they get a chance to see you, they get to see movement, they get to see your facial expressions. Um, you also can connect with them on your camera uh, with your eyes and all of that. And I think the audience really appreciates being able to see you. There's a greater connection. When you just have a picture up there, it's like, who am I connecting with? And what is she actually really talking about? So yeah, I would say if you're presenting, then have your picture. If you're in the audience, I know uh, for the district annual uh, meeting, everyone was muted both visually and auditorially. And again, in some respects, that helps with bandwidth as well. Okay, great. Um, there's a question about guests and should guests, what do you recommend for guests? Should they be live? Should they be on video or not? Um, again, I, I would say, thank you, there was an um. Uh, I, I believe that uh, unless you've got, you know, like a huge number of people like we did for the annual business meeting, where it would be distracting to have everyone on video and also it can impact your bandwidth, that it's nice to be able to see the reaction from your participants. I know right now I can only see three people um, off to the side. And with me looking at the camera, I don't see you in front of me because I'm sharing my screen. Uh, I think it's really up to you as the host as to what you are you most comfortable with. Do you want to see those reactions or would you prefer to just get through your presentation and then um, perhaps see reactions and, and chat more with the people in your group? Um, I'm choosing to do uh, questions after each piece. Uh, you may choose to do your questions all at the end, at which point you could unmute everybody both visually and uh, audi audi audibly um, to, to get that kind of reaction. So again, I would say that that's more of a comfort zone for you as the presenter. Okay, great. I am actually consolidating because people have similar themed questions. So okay. one, of the common, one of the common ones that's coming up is around at a Toastmasters meeting and giving a more formal speech, mm -hmm. would you recommend sitting or standing? Ooh, uh, to be honest with you, I like both. I think in some respects it, it has, I mean, personally, Toastmasters is all about standing and speaking and really using your stage. So, you know, using your body language, using gestures. And it, I find it's more difficult sitting to be able to really use the stage the way we do when we're uh, live. And so, I choose to stand except in this case um, because I had slides and I, I needed to be, I wasn't gonna, I didn't wanna keep reaching forward to be able to change my slides. 
but when I speak at our speech craft or at a club, generally I will stand because that's the traditional way for Toastmasters to give a presentation. Okay, thanks Linda. And then there are a couple of questions that I think you're going to be addressing ver um, later on. So one has to do with virtual backgrounds. You're going to yes. be covering that, yes? I'm covering that, oh yeah. Okay, great. And then here's a question on your thoughts on the use of a headset. Any specific recommendations on equipment or backdrop? Okay, and I am going to talk about that as well in your environment, which is coming up next. Okay. Okay. So and, hang on. If okay. I haven't answered your question, then repose it in the second round, but I'm, I'm planning on covering all of that in your environment. Okay, great. So Linda, would you like to move on? There, there is other stuff, but I'm mindful of the time as well. Okay, I will move along. All right, thank you, Sophia Lauren. Um, the environment into which you put your digital meeting, it's important on how you show up. Once you log in, you need to be aware of everything around you all the time. Things that you do or say can be very embarrassing, shocking, or sometimes even funny. Think that your camera is always on and that everyone can see and hear you all the time. Yes, there is a mute button for both audio and video, and we often forget to use it until someone remarks on a faux pas. As I mentioned before, it's critical that you test your audio and visual prior to getting on the call. The quality of your camera and microphone does really matter. Recognize that when using your cell phone as your camera, your screen is minimized. Usually there are a couple black lines on each side framing your picture. This is another place where you need to remember everything you say and do and the environment that you're sitting on, we, the audience, get to experience that. So when you're in your card, we can often experience your frustration with the traffic. We've talked about your camera and your microphone and suggested that you test both of them before getting on the call. It may be necessary to raise the level of your computer so that we're not looking up your nose as we are our donkey on the left, although I think he's actually an ass. Uh, it may be, um, laptops and iPads are extremely portable and many of us use them uh, and it makes it easier for you to be anywhere in your home or office, perhaps even in a comfy lounge chair, on a couch, or maybe even on your bed. The challenge here is that often we're holding the device on our lap, which means you're looking down at the camera. Thus we see up your nose. If necessary, put the device on a stack of books on, your, on a stable surface like a table, a desk, or even a chair have it high enough so that you're looking straight into the camera rather than down at it. Microphones are a wonder, and I thank you all for asking about this. It is great that we have included, that it's included in our camera, at least mine is, most of the time. However, if you want high quality audio, then a separate microphone is needed. While uh, earbuds may work well, and for the most part are, mo are invisible, uh, and more so than the traditional mic, I would definitely test your microphone for clarity and volume. Personally, I know that mine doesn't give me the professionalism that I would like, and I find it very difficult to hear. Um, oftentimes, the earbud comes falling out of my ear. I do have two other headsets, one of which is a Yeti, and it's the one that I used for my radio show. It's extremely professional. I love it. Um, but I don't like wearing the headset because it's a very large set of earmuffs. And somehow that just doesn't, for me, project well as a presenter. Having a spit guard, as this young man has, or what's known as a pop filter, is also a plus for great sound. So if you have a tendency to pop your peas, then having a pop filter would be important to do. 
For me too, using an external microphone means that everyone in the space doesn't have to listen to the meeting or the program, only to what I say. So it definitely has brought peace to my household. This is my integrator, Carrie Hargraves, so you get a chance to see her in person. Um, and there isn't much of what we're talking about today that isn't important, so I'll stop saying how important everything is. Yet lighting is something that's very special in that way. As you notice, Carrie's sitting at her computer. She lives in Arizona where the sun is extremely bright. How well do you see her? She's pretty dark. Yes, she could close her drapes. And to be honest, I've been on calls with her and it doesn't help much. With working at home, I certainly have a similar challenge in the fact that the light in the bedroom that has the computers is off to my right, stage left. I can close the blinds and the light still impacts the screen. This is why I do most of my video work here in the office. When you're dealing with bright, outside light, eliminate it if at all possible. This would be true also if you have a skylight in your space. One suggestion was to use ceiling light murals to reduce the glare. Because outside light also changes as the sun moves from sunrise to sunset, it's best to check the light at the time of day when you intend to present. I was in a board meeting um, at home a couple of weeks ago. As the sun set, my room went from being very lighted to almost black, even with the lamps on my desk. My face became the only object visible, and I looked like a floating white face or like the picture from Scream. It wasn't very pretty. When looking for light inside, it should be coming from behind your camera. It should not illuminate just part of your face, nor should it, be, should it light just half your face. To illuminate the entire face, one of the things I recommend is using a circular lamp that can give you just the right lighting and is more even than a table lamp, a desk lamp, or even a fluorescent lamp. Also look for light bulbs that don't turn you yellow or red for that matter. There are many experts on the internet who can help you get just the right lighting package for your environment. And I'll tell you, don't hesitate to talk to them because they'll save you lots of time and lots of money. Find a quiet space for your video conference. Go into a quiet room, shut the door, and mute yourself. Let others know that you are going to be on a Zoom call and for approximately how long. When I'm on a video call after hours, I take the trash out of the office, put a sign on the door that says filming, and it definitely keeps the traffic down and the noise under control. Having a great microphone, as we've talked about, is fabulous for when you talk. However, hearing the dogs barking, or howling in this case, the cats yowling, the baby crying, children screaming, the garbage truck picking up trash, the gardener mowing the lawn, the co contractor tearing out walls, helicopters overhead, and the police or fire sirens can be very distracting. And yes, on my radio show, I have had all of those. There is a mute button on most professional microphones just for this purpose. There's also a mute button on Zoom that should be used whenever you're not talking. Some of the sound distractions can't be avoided or planned for, but for those that can, make that plan, and for those that you can't, use your mute button. Okay, you all, you asked about this. 
The new trick is for virtual backgrounds. It's the darling of the digital world right now. Movies and television have been using them for computer generated characters as well as backgrounds for years, especially where they're not really filming. This saves time and cost. You don't need to travel to locations and you don't get, need to get permits to use the location. However, these are professionals and even with all of their technology, you can still tell it's not real. As you can see in the picture, if you don't do it right, you lose yourself in the background as you move. The image in the foreground disappears as it moves or you lose part of the background. It appears that you have fallen off the Golden Gate Bridge or into the ocean or for one man eaten by the tiger that's behind you. One individual the other day moved and his head was the only thing visible. It was not a pretty sight. It is not just distracting if the virtual background has movement. I find I get mesmerized by the swaying palm trees or the rushing surf. Who do you want the audience to pay attention to? You or your background? because that's what they're watching if you don't use a green screen. Green screens are great to have behind you. It does hold the virtual background still. But again, watch what you're using. Do you want your people to think that you're in outer space or at the beach or watching the Golden Gate Bridge? Or do you want them to know that you are with them in the Zoom room? I couldn't resist this image. There are moments when individuals within their virtual backgrounds that they appear to be eaten by a plant similar to this Venus flytrap from Little Shop of Horrors. Think long and hard about using them. If you decide that yes, then putting a branded background up like Toastmasters, your own brand or timer cards make sure you have that green screen behind you so that you don't get lost in the background. That is what a computer graphics artist does to make the background not move with the actors. If you don't have one, then I would say don't use a virtual background until you do. Some other things to consider in your environment. Think about what's in it. The last thing we all want to see is your dirty laundry stacked on the floor or on other surfaces, your dirty dishes on the counter or even on your desk, the unmade bed or the messy desk or even the messy bookcase. Of course with the bookcase the participants may be looking at what you're currently reading. I can tell you that's true. Because I actually did some of my first podcasts in front of a bookcase in my apartment. And it wasn't until I had somebody ask me the question that I realized that that's where my audience was focused and not on me. I never used that background again. Although I've had a thought about putting my book on the bookcase and having it face out, but I just haven't found the right environment in which to make that happen. But it would be a great way to advertise the book or your book as the case may be. So what do we do instead? Well, the easiest thing to do is to start with a simple background, such as a plain wall like you see here. You can add some potted plants or flowers in a vase they can be live or they can be Memrex. If they're Memrex, make sure they've been dusted. The last thing you wanna see is a dusty plant sitting next to you. You can add a branded picture as I have behind me. Uh, those are my lions. It's um, a fabulous picture called Changing Lanes. And it's a pride of female lions who are sort of meandering all over the road with only one of them watching the hyena behind them. 
This actually supports my brand of herding cats. You can use a backdrop or a screen, and I'm gonna do a shout out to Kimmy Avery, who has a beautiful throw that is attached to the back of a bookcase that's perfect for her. She keeps it simple and uncluttered, and she has virtual flowers next to her that she can move so that they change and you get a different view and you think you're in a different space each time. Check it out, however, before you go virtual. Okay, so Pamela, what questions, I'm sorry, Patricia, what questions do we have in the chat box? We have a lot of activity in the chat box. There are, have been some folks submitting ideas for things like lighting. There are a lot of questions around lighting and one of the common ones has to do with people who wear eyeglasses and the mm -hmm. glare that shows up and what are some ways to avoid that. One person said that they got a a ring light, but it makes the glare on the eyeglasses worse. So what are your recommendations for that? Um, yeah, generally, it's where you place that ring light um, in such a way that you're not necessarily looking straight at it. Um, it might need to be either down or up. Um, I would check that and see. Um, what I basically say is keep moving it around. The ring light is great. Um, but keep moving it around until the glare in your glasses isn't there. Um, I'm lucky in the fact that I have overhead lights and so that doesn't cause a problem. Um, but basically the light can't be reflecting off your eyeglasses. You could also, if you don't need your glasses to be able to present, you might actually consider not wearing them. Got it, thank that you. That doesn't answer your question, you know, pose another Yes, please. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and continue on with some of the other questions. There was one around where you can, where can you get a green screen? Is it a literal physical screen? It is a literal vis uh, physical screen and you can get them, surprise, surprise, on Amazon. Um, just you, um, make sure you know what the dimensions are behind you um, and that you have enough room. I mean, I can't use a green screen because I don't have enough room between me and the wall to be able to set it up behind me, which is what you need to do. And oftentimes they're on feet that may be too uh, wide for you to be able to use in your space. So recognize how, how tall do you need to be, how wide do you need it to be, and uh, what do the feet look like. I do have one uh, at my apartment that I used before I moved uh, to the office. And the big challenge with it was folding it up afterwards uh, because they're not necessarily easy to take down and fold up. So that's the caveat and the, and the difficulty with it. Okay, and there was also another suggestion for a website from someone in the audience mm -hmm. on where to get a green screen. So thank you for that. There, are, there have been a couple other questions regarding guest etiquette. I believe you have that, that coming up later. So one of the questions, for example, is, is it inappropriate to drink coffee or water while your video <laughs> is on as a guest? Mm -hmm. And is that something, Linda, that you're covering in a that's little bit? The next, yeah, that's the next piece. The third piece is on your manners. So yes, we will talk okay. about it there. Okay, and just, I wanna get to one earlier question that had to do with background. So you covered virtual backgrounds quite mm -hmm. a bit, but what about the photographs that people sometimes have as backgrounds also distracting, I'm assuming you're gonna say? Yeah, I'm gonna say it's, it's distracting, but the same hold, um, putting up a picture behind you is if you don't have a green screen, then it's gonna move. Um, so it's not just the virtual backgrounds because people who are using the timing cards um, in Toastmasters without the, uh, the green screen, they, are, they will also move in and out of the timing cards, can, which can be extremely distracting. Okay, great. And then we did have a contribution from one of the participants that depending on the, the power of your computer, you may or may not need a green screen on Zoom. Um, Zoom uh, does say that you don't necessarily have to have a green screen, but what, what I've observed so far is unless somebody has a green screen, it doesn't matter the power of their computer, um, we still see the movement. So check it out if you're computer is that powerful and you don't see the movement, but I would also uh, 
do it with somebody who can give you feedback on what's going on with your, your uh, virtual background. Okay, and if folks want to take a look at Joe Amaro, who is on the video, he's waving right now. He is saying that he is not using a green screen. Looks like he does have a virtual background, and you can check out the quality of his video. And I can, I can tell you that Mark Burchill is moving in his green screen. Yeah, so different different types of experiences yeah. and qualities with, yeah. with green screen. Um, Linda, before you move on, just one more question that just came in about what kind of webcam do you recommend? Ooh, um, I'm using a Logitech. I happen to like it a whole lot. Um, and that was what was uh, recommended to me when I uh, needed a camera. Uh, the one thing I do find is that the ones in your computer may or may not be of the best quality. Okay, great. I'm going to recommend that we move on and I will scan all of the questions to see what I might have missed and I can pick those up at the end, but I know we do want to move on to the guest etiquette piece. Sounds good. Okay. So are y'all having a good time? If so, you know, a reaction would be great. You know? Okay. Moving on. Ah, my friend's desk. Um, this third, third segment is all about your manners. Um, this could represent all the things you should not have in your background. It can also represent all the distractors that you have as a guest or a host. With all this around you, how can you concentrate on just one thing, the event that you're participating in? Think about it. How many of you have gotten bored with this presentation? and have slipped over to check your email, done a, a Google search on something that I said, like what might be great ring lights or what's a great camera or anything along those lines. How about your cell phone? Did you remember to mute it before you got on the call? Does it light up whenever someone calls or sends you a text or a message on Facebook? Does it distract you? Do you ever check it and respond? Of course we do. The audience moves around a lot and you can usually tell what they're doing because again, we don't tend to mute our audio or video. Try not to multitask even though you know you are really, really, really good at it and you won't miss a thing while you're off handling that email. If it's an emergency, then make sure you're muted, especially your camera. Someone asked the question about eating, right? Just curious, in your Toastmasters meeting, how many of you eat during the meeting? Any hands? Okay. The ones I've attended, including my speech craft and heart to heart, to name a couple, if food is served, it's usually during a break or after the meeting. Why would you do something different just because we've changed platforms? Sometimes there's a perceived casualness with going digital. There appears to be a sense that the rules have changed and we can do things we would never think of doing or actually do when live and in person. I know that live meetings, when they're full day, there's often snacks and water to keep us going, especially in, in a day-long meeting. Again, if it's a full day, usually there's a lunch break. Now, if it's a working lunch, then everyone's eating. So it's not just watching one person um, eat a very large hamburger or someone slurping their noodles. It is especially true if you eat in person. Another manners aspect is not talking while you're eating. You were taught not to talk when your mouth was full. Let's not start now that we're on digital. Remember too where your camera is situated. If you have it set up correctly, you are the only one in the picture. You're front and center with the entire group. That means we get to watch 
every bite, every slurp, and every chew of your meal very up close and personal. If you need to eat anything during a meeting, please mute both your audio and your video. In a recent meeting, one of the participants let the host know that she had to eat something on a regular schedule and that she would be mute during the meal. The courtesy was really greatly appreciated. And once again, think before you act. It'll make you a thoughtful and appreciated guest at the meeting. If you are the host, then set the expectations up front and you definitely need to be the example. We talked earlier about external distractions such as helicopters, police, fire, garbage trucks, landscapers, and how to handle them. There are distractors that generally are outside of our home or office. Whether we normally work at home or doing so now because of shelter in place, there are other very special critters around that need to be handled in loving ways. In a recent meeting, one of the participants coined the words pet zooming. If you work in an open space like a kitchen or a dining room, these creatures generally have free reign of the space. They love to jump up on a table or the desk and check out what you're doing. When I had cats, they, for the most part, walked me to work and then left to do their thing for the rest of the day. When they came back at the end of the day, they wanted to be fed their evening meal. They once again showed up and very persistently walked across my desk in front of the computer screen. I understand you're at home and your pets want attention. They don't always understand why you're not attending to them and their needs. They're very important people, don't you know? What you see as a participant in the meeting is oftentimes a tail walking by, or in this case, a full cat sitting in front of you as you work. You may even see just the dog as we see to the right. Where did you go? There are also birds in the background who can speak in colorful language during the meeting. Or I actually had one woman come in with a snake dra draped around her neck because her boa constrictor wanted to be at the program. It is not only pets that can be distracting you when you're working on a video call. Many of us have children at home during these unusual times. If they're school age, they could also be in classrooms with their teachers doing virtual class work or homework. They're generally really quiet as they concentrate on their material. Those with younger children, well, they can interrupt you in their own unique ways. If you've ever been on FaceTime or Duo with a 17 month old, you know where I speak. There is a constant energy and need for attention. If possible, have another family member take them to a different room or try to do it during nap time if you can. If not, then definitely mute yourself as much as possible. If it is a training, then you might wanna consider listening to the recording afterwards. Everyone, including yourself, will be very, very grateful. If at all possible, ban pets from your studio. Close the door. However, I also recognize that pets don't always understand why they can't be with you and will set up a lively protest outside the door. Be as aware as you can and take action that is appropriate for your situation, always thinking about your fellow participants. Oh yes. I never thought I would have to say this, but don't take your laptop to the bathroom. It's just so easy to just pick it up and carry it with you so that you don't miss any of the important topics to be discussed. Yes, I have seen people do this, even as the entire meeting room is shouting, no, no, don't go there. Usually we're not listening and we're oblivious to what we're doing. This is definitely private behavior that should not be seen or heard by those with you. 
Other private actions could include scratching your armpits, picking your nose, cleaning your ears, biting your fingernails. Just remember, we see it all, unless you're mute, and it's difficult to forget what you've seen. And yes, this actually did happen on a Zoom call. If there are other people in your studio space, let them know that you're going on air. Again, because I share space with my husband and he sometimes requires IT support, especially, I especially let him know when I'm going into the meeting and when I'll be out. He can hear the sound of talking, but not the actual words when I'm filming. It is amazing to me though, that he knows exactly when I get off and comes in for that IT support that he's been waiting for. As I said in the evenings, I put my trash out, I put a sign up that says filming, and I make sure that our cleaning people wait until I am finished. And by the way, the sign is in both English and Spanish. Um, it has been a tremendous help, and I know Rosa extremely appreciates the warning. When you're the host on a digital call, it's important to only invite those participants that need to be there. It can make the meeting much more productive. However, in Toastmasters, we are all about having visitors attend our meetings to check us out and to experience the power of a Toastmasters meeting. In addition, connection is very important for you and for your guests. It's recommended that you have participants introduce themselves. When you address guests by name, it signals that you know who they are and, get the, and it gets their attention. The neat thing about Zoom is that the person's name usually shows up on their picture, although sometimes you get their husbands or their kids, depending upon whose Zoom they're actually using, um, unless they call in on their phone and then you'll get their phone number. However, you as the host can actually change their name so that you know who the person is and not just their phone number. So how can you do this? Well, if it's a large group, you can invite the participants to put where they're coming from in the chat, along with why are they here? Why did they come on this call? What do they hope to get out of it? In smaller groups, you can have the individuals actually introduce themselves, but do set the parameters. Who are they? What do they do? Maybe a question applicable to the topic of the day and keep the introductions short so it doesn't fill up the entire meeting time. Thank you, Ashley. As the host, starting on time and ending on time is very important. And they're concepts to definitely keep in mind. As a guest, being on time and ready to begin is vital. You know how distracting it is for people to wander into a face-to-face -face meeting. It's just as challenging with digital meetings. Both hosts and if possible guests should also review and be familiar with the agenda for the day. By being very familiar with the agenda, you know when you can anticipate speaking and be ready for it. Nothing causes anxiety more than not being prepared and ready when the host calls your name. Another aspect that irritates participants is going over time. If you're going to be late, then if you can, let the audience know that you recognize this. Let them know how much longer you anticipate the meeting to last and get consensus from the participants that it's okay. This can definitely reduce the anxiety, the clock checking, and the anticipation of what the heck is going on. One key place to monitor is presentations and discussions. Managing their time can be very important for a great meeting that ends on time. What that may mean is doing a bit of what I call potential problem analysis. Here, looking at what could go wrong, it's a topic that is controversial, or there are lots of questions that could be asked, or a long discussion could begin. This is a place that you could look at what could cause this to occur, like anticipating the questions, incorporating the answers into the presentation, putting questions in the chat. If you can't anticipate what the audience 
might ask, then perhaps it makes sense to have a separate meeting to address this topic and to have that discussion offline so that in the meeting, you're presenting the results, not beginning the dialogue. One thing I can say about Toastmasters is that we are, as a general rule, we are very cognizant of time and being on time. Finally, there are some things that are beyond our control. However, with that said, again, anticipate the unexpected. I once had a guest who came in from Billings, Montana. We were on Skype and using audio only. She'd warned me that her Wi-Fi was generally very good, but if it became windy outside, it was altogether possible for her to lose the connection. As it turned out, the wind started about halfway through the show. I lost her three times, and the last one was as we were beginning to wrap up. I could hear her as the connection went bad, saying, deleted expletive, deleted expletive, deleted expletive. I wrapped up the show, asked my tech if we could delete the deleted expletives in the replay, and then I called her back. We had been about to cover one or two tips that I wanted her to give, and she just didn't, wasn't there. We'd been able to cover the first two with commercials, but the third one, I had to dance very fast and end the meeting. She said that she knew that she was going offline, that her connection was ending, and she didn't realize that her deleted expletives were actually on the show. So unless the whole system goes down, I know I have a reliable connection. As they say, weather happens. With PG&E here in California doing public safety power shutdowns, you can't always plan to be somewhere else during a meeting or presentation. This happened to a speaker that I had this weekend and luckily he knew on Friday that they were likely to shut him down. We had two contingency plans, including coming to my office in Walnut Creek or going to his daughter's house in Sonoma. Either would have worked and the key was being ready to move when the lights went out. So what are the things that you have in place that can help you through crises such as this? So Patricia, one last round of questions. Well, Linda, we are actually over time by a couple of minutes. So let me just say that, first of all, the additional things that have been popping up in the chat are some a lot of compliments towards you and what a great presentation this was and how people were most definitely not bored and not distracted and really appreciate a lot of the tips that you had. There were a couple of additional questions about guest etiquette specifically related to popping in and out with video. And some of that was actually there were some best practices shared in the chat. So I think I will go ahead and leave it at that in terms of Q&A, if that's okay. And that's I just, fine. and then I, I wanna move to, to wrapping up. Can I make so, my final, my, my final yeah. statement? Great. Yeah, go ahead. It was, my, it was my desire to give you some of the best practices for using Zoom while in shelter in place and beyond. Following these tips and tricks will help you put your best foot forward. Give yourself every advantage by taking these tips to heart and incorporating them into your exceptional Zoom experience. Patricia. Thank you so much, Linda. That was absolutely wonderful. And everyone, please join me in thanking Linda. You can put clap, applause, or ovation in the chat box if you'd like, since they're all muted. That would be great. And then just moving towards our close, a few ad additional logistical things. There is a survey link in the chat box. If you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes to complete this survey, it does help us improve quite a bit. And I'll also send it out after the meeting. This uh, presentation was recorded and the recording link will be available at the District 57 site. And here's a screenshot of it. And then finally, if you do have any questions, please contact masterclass at d57tm.org. Just a heads up that our next masterclass is coming up on Monday, May 18th. It's gonna be Ashley Harkness, 
talking about putting humor into your speeches. If you haven't already registered, please do so at the masterclass site that you see on the screen. And with that, I want to thank all of you for your participation. Thank you for hanging in there till the very end. There were many of you who did. And once again, thank you so much, Linda. I think many of us, if not all of us, are going to take away your tips and apply them right away since we have several opportunities to do so. Thank you, for Patricia, so very much for inviting me to do this. And it was my pleasure. Thank you, Linda. And goodbye, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day.